May I have the grace to speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we come to the end of chapter 6 in John's Gospel. We've been there for several weeks now, seeing Jesus feed the hungry multitudes, and then hearing Jesus describing himself as the bread of life, the true bread that nourishes us, the food of eternal, abundant life given by the Father through Jesus. And we've seen that some who have been listening to Jesus cannot accept what he's saying, and they turn away. Today, Jesus notices the grumbling and turns to his closest disciples and asks them, point blank, do you also wish to go away? We can imagine that maybe there's a moment of silence. And then Simon Peter, ever the bold one, makes this astonishing reply, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else shall we go? What other source of wisdom, what other source of life and meaning will satisfy us? Notice how Peter phrases his response, you have the words of eternal life. Perhaps for us as alert readers of the Gospel of John, when Peter says words, we see a connection with the very beginning of the gospel. In the prologue to John, we learn that the word of God exists from the beginning, a creation, and then becomes flesh and lives among us. So when Peter says that Jesus has the words of eternal life, we can add, Jesus not only has the words, he is the word. Faith in Jesus is not so much a matter of believing certain propositions, but rather of encountering the Word of God in human form. We call that incarnation, God's taking on human flesh so that we might see the Holy One of God, the source of our abundant life, living among us. Where else shall we go? What other encounter will give us this bread of life, these words of spirit and life, as Jesus says? He invites us into an encounter with him so that we too may abide in the Father as he does. Yes, it may be difficult, and there may be times when we want to turn away, but it is in Jesus that we find our true identity as his disciples. This passage is the first time that the gospel writer calls Jesus' closest disciples the Twelve. Perhaps this signals that they are becoming a real group, a community, as they choose to stay with Jesus. And it can signal for us as the church that our community is created not so much by creed or program or worship style, but by an encounter and a willingness to follow Jesus Christ. And it can also give us heart to continue to follow, even if our numbers are growing smaller, or our influence waning, or we hear something we don't like. In our first reading today from the Hebrew Scriptures, we see a worshiping community coming together. Solomon, the son of David and now king of Israel, has built a splendid temple in Jerusalem. He assembles the people and offers a prayer of dedication, a part of which we read today. Solomon praises God who has kept the covenant, the promise of steadfast love for God's people. He claims the promise made to David that the kingdom will be established forever if the people continue to walk in God's ways. And he prays that God will hear the prayers offered in the temple, saying, Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place. Heed and forgive. Heed and forgive. The primary acts of worship in the temple were elaborate rituals of sacrifice, offering animals to be slaughtered as a sign of repentance or thanksgiving or petition for God's guidance. 
As the temple is dedicated, we read in this passage that 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep are offered on that day, the flesh of animals as a sign of obedience to God. Might have been kind of messy. (laughs) Jesus has rewritten the commands of sacrifice to offer himself, his flesh and blood, as the sign of restoration with God. It's a metaphorical understanding soon to be made real in Jesus' death. He submits to execution by political powers to show the depth of God's love for us with words of forgiveness on his lips as he dies. Following Jesus becomes our way of worship, our way of living in sacrificial love for God and neighbor. We offer our prayers of confession, acknowledging the ways we have failed to love God and neighbor, and we receive the words of assurance of God's forgiveness through the grace of Christ's love restored in our hearts. We humans are made to be in community. We find our fulfillment and our identity there. A group has both power and danger. Our identity may be distorted when we find ourselves part of a group which plays to our fears, our stereotypes, and our desire to exclude. The urge for a young person to join a gang is rooted in this need to belong. We see the impulse terribly played out in white supremacy groups that demonize the other and reinforce xenophobia through racist violence and hate crimes. Being called into community with Christ is the antidote to appeals to fears, selfishness, and greed. An encounter with Jesus draws us into a life-giving relationship which affirms the value of all human life as blessed by God. Our worship of praise and thanksgiving arise from our realization of God's forgiveness as we acknowledge the ways that we have become separated from God's love in our personal and common lives. And that means facing difficult truths about ourselves and our society. Just a bit later in this gospel, in chapter 8, Jesus says, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth. Hard truth sometimes. Truths often buried beneath denial or blindness or the comfortable half lies that we live with. Again, our first lesson is suggestive. Solomon becomes extremely wealthy on the backs of the peasant people of Israel. He builds houses and ships. He lives in great luxury with, I'm not kidding, this is what it says, 700 wives and 300 concubines. (laughs) It's like all those sheep. (laughs) Hundreds of servants and fine foods and furnishings. He builds the great temple decorated with gold, fine woods, and jewels. And he accomplishes this with enslaved labor. Slavery of the indigenous peoples who have survived the slaughter when the Israelites took possession of their land. The temple is built on forced labor. The scriptures don't hide these facts. The account is in the very next chapter after our reading today. Now, there's no evidence that the forgiveness Solomon is praying for includes confession of the ways he has exploited others to achieve his wealth. And this is the last session, the last lesson about David and Solomon that we have in our lectionary for now. But, spoiler alert, Solomon is the last king of the united Israel. Internal turmoils lead to division of the kingdom into two kingdoms and ultimately both fall to foreign forces and the temple is destroyed. 
the whole truth. What startles you? What causes you to take a deep breath as you hear this story? Does it remind you of the journey we are on at St. Paul's? To discover the hard truths of our history, to know how we got to this place, literally and figuratively. Not to blame our ancestors or to paralyze us with guilt, but to accept responsibility for what we have inherited. To see the ways in which privilege and oppression create deprivation as well as monuments. To experience the beauty of this place as pointers to God's glory and not signs of our own wealth and pride. So that our confession, our desire for forgiveness, and our willingness to make amends are based on honesty and humility. A parishioner in another city once told me that a low point in his life he began looking for a church. He came to a service of morning prayer that begins with a confession. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. He says he felt a great sense of relief in hearing those words, sensing that this was a place where he could join with others who are honest about themselves and their lives, not pretending to be perfect. Where else shall we go? Where else can we find relationships based, based on truth-telling in a place where we can be known and loved by God? What other place offers the liberation of forgiveness, God's sacrificial love that enables us to forgive ourselves and each other? What other source will draw us together and form us as a community of love and caring for one another? So we respond by coming together as a worshiping community to praise the source of our life and to be fed and strengthened to take our part in being Christ's life-giving force in the world. Amen. Amen.